This is Jeffrey Crevero. With me is Dr. Connie Lester and Daniela Lynham, and I'm conducting an oral history with Reverend Dr. Robert Spooney. The interview is being conducted at Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Institutional Church in the Paramore neighborhood of Orlando, Florida, on Monday, July 17th, 2023. Reverend Spooney, thank you for speaking with us today. Would you please begin by stating your name and telling us a little bit about where you're from and what life was like for you growing up? Well, first of all, thank you for this uh, honor to be able to contribute to the education of, of our people. Um, again, my name is Reverend Dr. Robert M. Spooney. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I currently am the pastor of Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Institutional Church where we are sitting. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, born and raised in Orlando, Florida. Was, was born, uh, actually, my first six years were at uh, 1020 and a half West Bentley Street in the Paramore area. Uh, was delivered at the office of uh, Dr. James Smith. This was prior to African Americans going to uh, be delivered at hospitals. Uh, the house that we lived in was what's called a shotgun house. You familiar with that term, which means that if you stood in the front door and fired a shotgun, it would go all the way through the end and not touch anybody if they were not in standing in from door to door. Um, and um, attended this church, as a matter of fact, as a child uh, all my life. So I have a integral relationship with Paramore, uh, being that. My church was located here. I had relatives that lived in the area as well. Even though we moved out into what is now called Washington Shores, I started school at the Callahan Elementary School, which is now called the Callahan Center. Uh, first and second, first in the first semester of the second grade until we moved over to Washington Shores again. Uh, life in Orlando at that time, this was an agrarian city back in my youth. Uh, citrus was the name of the game. And this was uh, this was way before uh, Disney. Consequently, it was a, not a one horse town, but a, a, a quiet city. Still ahead to all of the remnant, remnants of, of uh, Jim Crowism existed during that time. But for the most part, uh, life was peaceful as long as you did not uh, venture outside the realms of the law. And I can remember uh, the community being a close-knit community. Uh, next door to us was Miss Ella down the street. Was, you know, these, these ladies, I can't remember the names now, uh, Miss Evelyn, uh, they were all like surrogate mothers. Everybody could uh, say something to, their, to a child who was out of line and you were and we would bet our bottom dollar that that information would get to our parents before, <laughs> before sunset. So uh, it was ser seriously a situation where the village was raising a child. Uh, I remember all of the streets that we have here in Paramore now, I remember when most of these streets were dirt streets before the uh, city started paving them. And, and uh, one of the highlights during the summer was when the tractors would come in and smooth the roads out and you get to run behind the tractors and do all of those type of things. But uh, life was a little different. Uh, um, it was safe. Uh, I, I don't recall homeless individuals as being as prominent as, as they are today. Uh, I remember walking from 1020 and a half West Bentley to Mount Zion here at 535 West Washington Street, even as a six year old, uh, without uh, the accompaniment of our parents. Uh, the only thing was my, my older sister and, and myself and my younger brother. This was before my youngest sister was born. And, all, and, and the only thing we had accompanying us was our dog Rex. <laughs> and uh, he wait outside the church. <laughs> We got out of church and we he'd walk us back home. So life was different. From an, from an economic standpoint, this, the community was um, self-contained, as I like to say. I remember barbershops, cleaners. The convenience stores were not like they are today. 
convenience stores were actually African Americans who were running those convenience stores. I remember restrictions on dealing with certain entities like Publix and Winn-Dixie. But for the most part, it was safe and everything was good. Excellent. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you attended school? What are some memories that stand out and were there any specific teachers that you remember? Uh, my first grade teacher was Miss McClendon. I remember her. Uh, my second grade teacher. I don't remember my second grade teacher at Callahan, but when I moved to Washington Shores, my second grade uh, my second grade teacher was Mrs. Rivers, um, but, but uh, excuse me, Mrs. Not Black, Mrs. Rivers was fifth grade. But uh, I, re I remember, uh, the thing that I remember about being educated, I, I went to a daycare center or kindergarten on Federal Street, and even in my mind I can remember the freshness of the, the daily milk that we received in these glass milk, small milk bottles. That, and uh, several of the individuals who were in kindergarten with me, one of them is Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hanson Graham. Uh, she, we're still friends, uh, and, uh, and and so I, my, my 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 memory of is vivid of just being taught early how to write using the right cursive, uh, things of that sort that is not being taught today. Uh, certainly going to to elementary school, it still was in the black community, but not in parable. I remember that uh, there were, when I was growing up, it was Callahan Elementary School, Holden Street Elementary School, and Washington Shores Elementary School. Eccleston was a school that was for uh, individuals who had physical handicaps, but later on it became a full-fledged elementary school. In 1960, I believe it was, Callahan closed. So there was no school in, in, uh, in, in Paramore Elementary School until they opened the ACE Academic, uh, what they call the uh, Academic Center of Excellence, uh, which is now at K through eighth grade center, which opened in 2018, I believe, or, or somewhere along those lines. So during that period of time, there was no school no, in Killahan. Holden Heights probably closed about 65. Not Holden Heights, but Holden Street Elementary School. And so, but I do recall May Day, Play Days, or just uh, the, what was prominent to me more than anything else was that you would see your teachers in the community. Not only at church, but in the grocery store. Uh, our sixth grade teacher, Mr. Perry, Perry Barrington, probably played such an important role in my development uh, in sports and as a man. Uh, certainly we do have Mrs. Stretcher, who now is Dr. Harris. Uh, retired educator from Valencia College. Uh, she, she taught me sixth grade as well as uh, uh, others, Ms. Her Herndon, uh, Ms. Her Dr. Herndon, and just many others. And I just can remember the impact that they had on us. They, they didn't force us to learn, but they, they gave us a desire to, to want to achieve and to learn, knowing that education was going to be the catalyst to, 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 to better our lives when we were growing up. Um, so they're, they're fun memories. I, I remember uh, <laughs> being taught the rudiments of discipline because we were, uh, uh, Mr. Barrington was a retired uh, sergeant, I think the E7, first sergeant from the Army. So we would have drill every day and learn how to march and all of these type of things. And, and then he would also have the boys. We would have boxing matches, et cetera. It would, it would be. And so I, I remember Mr. Barrington instilling in us, say, the reason we're doing this is so that you can grow up to be a man and you can understand how do you need, sometimes you need to follow orders, exp explain what discipline is. And I remember our boxing was, was, was basically so that you could uh, 
face your your, your adversities and and, uh, and and not have a fear of failing. Because certainly, if you box, and I box for a moment or two, you know, if you don't lose, if you don't win, you don't you can't fall apart. You just pull up your bootstraps and get ready for the next one. So anyway, those are the type of things I remember from high school. Man, if you want me to talk about high school, high school at Jones High School. Again, you had uh, uh, individuals who were, who, co who were our teachers, Mr. Howard, he taught me in seventh grade, but he eventually became the principal <clears throat> at, uh, at Howard, at, uh, at uh, Carver Junior High. Uh, Mr. Knapp Ford, he taught me, and he, he, he became the first, uh, one of the, the second African-American city commissioner in the city of Orlando, uh, uh, Mr. Clark. He coached me and uh, he died, he passed away from a heart attack early, but he was instrumental in the Hall of Famer at Floyd a and football and things of that sort. And so all of these men and, and, and the ladies, Mrs. Miss, Miss Dudley, English teacher, Mrs. Butts, English teacher, Mrs. Uh, Williams, English teacher, uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, who, who taught uh, math, Mr. Burns, who taught math, but, but I remember them all molding us. Miss Dudley was, uh, was was so profound. She eventually became Doctor Doctor Elma Dudley, and she was again a professor, if not at UCF, also at uh, Valencia uh, Community College. But they all helped form formulate. It was formulate this desire to the spirit of excellence. So education for, for our little group, you know, we we were children and we were teenagers and we did all those things, but we also wanted to excel in everything that we did. Uh, I, I, my, my junior and senior year, my junior year, I was on the first football team that actually integrated football because prior to that, we couldn't even play Edgewater and Boone and all of those schools and that, that exist today. And so, but my, my junior year was the first year we had an integrated ball and integrated sports. And so there was an evolution that we saw, you know, a change in time. Many, many of my classmates that started with, with, uh, with us in seventh grade, Jones High was seventh through 12th grade. And so when we went to Jones High, I got a chance to see some seniors who, uh, and, and, uh, and, and who wanted to excel, and so they set an example for us. Uh, but some of my classmates, by the time we got to the ninth grade, when integration was starting to come into full-fledged, full force, uh, they became the pioneers that went over to uh, Edgewater and Boone and Evans as the first African-Americans who were uh, students at those schools. And as a result of the, de the, uh, the desegregation ruling that had come down from not only the Supreme Court but through Orange County, uh, which fought it, by the way, <laughs> uh, uh, vehemently, <laughs> and uh, uh, they were actually forced before they integrated with students. They they, they decided to, to take the teachers, <laughs> and so uh, I remember um, it was 1967 going into 1968. They had this lottery. And uh, so <clears throat> it was supposedly a lottery, but somehow or another, many of the best teachers in the African American at Jones High, uh, they, they, they were put into the, they were pulled away and sent to these other schools to integrate. So before they actually put bodies of students in those schools, they really attempted to integrate the system through teachers, and that didn't work too well. And they had to come back. The NAACP did what they needed to do to to, to, to counter that, as I recall, and. Uh, and then you had to, that first wave of African American students going to Edgewater. Uh, individuals like uh, I remember Arthur Robinson, uh, Gordon Pledge, uh, Wendy and Wanda Head. I can remember those individuals. We were in the seventh grade. Many of us went to the elementary school together, but they chose to go to uh, to, to to be part of. Uh, that, that, that first wave of, of uh, brave students to integrate. I chose not to. I didn't want to go. My parents gave me that choice. And I said, nah, I'm going to stay at Jones High. And I, I didn't want to go. I'm glad I did. I'm making my 
chores, too, to be honest. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, beginning with maybe the early church and some of the early pastors? Right. I, I, I couldn't give you all of those names if, if, you know, if I'd have known that question was going to be asked. I'd have put on, there's a wall with all of that on there. But the church was formed in uh, 1880. It, is just, it was actually uh, uh, started in Paramore. They, they used what they called a, uh, uh, an arbor bush type concept. Basically it was a lean-to uh, with, with limbs, etc., so, so that they could have a meeting place. Started in 1880, uh, so this year we celebrate 143 years. We've had you know, 20 or so different pastors, and, and uh, the most prominent and uh, during the years, I mean, so they started doing uh, Reconstruction, when, when Reconstruction was just about ending, and it was prominent during uh, the Jim Crow era. era. Uh, the only church that's older than Mount Zion in Central Florida, to my knowledge, black or white, is First Baptist which is a year older than us, which makes me think that many of the blacks who, 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 who the, the, those who founded our church at one time or another probably were part of that contingent that set up in, when they wouldn't allow blacks to come. When, they would, when you came to church, you had to sit up in the back. <laughs> and so I would imagine that they formed that, uh, uh, and all of that came out of that, I don't know. But, um, so, so we've been around 143 years, prominent, prominent in the community. We've had uh, many individuals who've come through the church and lived in Orlando. Uh, one of our pastors was uh, a, 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 a Reverend Hill, was very prominent in the Florida General Baptist Convention, uh, as was his wife. The Florida General Baptist Convention was formed in 1879, so it's a year older than my life. And we're part of that convention today. And uh, the, the, uh, the, his wife was the president of the Ladies Auxiliary for years and years. So we've always done a lot of outreach. Most people don't understand that an institutional church, and we are a missionary Baptist institutional church, and the title institutional doesn't mean that we institutionalize. It means that the church was used as a school. And so uh, anytime you see a church where they it's a, whether it's African Methodist Episcopal, if it's got institutional behind it, it means that it's once some time, at one time, it based, it was served as a place of education. And so, uh, so we've always pushed that. Um, there was a member of the uh, Orange County Public School System, one of the first administrators was a member of this church, L. Claudia Allen. And so we give away our L. Claudia Allen scholarship here at Mount Zion every year. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sunday is the Sunday when we'll give out our scholarship to our graduates. We only have one graduate uh, this year for 2023. And she's already in school. And uh, But uh, we, we commemorate uh, Dr. Allen and, uh, and for her work uh, with this scholarship. And so, uh, so the history of Mount Zion, most people don't realize it, or maybe they do, uh, that um, Many of our pastors were in, entrenched in the NAACP. Now, back in the day, the NAACP did not make its membership public because if that would became, became the case, I mean, you know those guys with the KKK, when the KKK would have used that to harass people. But many of our, our, our pastors were former presidents of the NAACP, and one in particular was Reverend N.G. Staggers. Dr. Pastor Staggers became Pastor Mount Zion, I believe, in 1946. Uh, he baptized me. And I believe he, it was 1970 or 71 when he retired. But during his, during his pastorate, he, was, he, he led the NAACP. And he was the pastor that was involved in the, in the uh, civil rights, uh, desegreg the Orange County School Board des desegregation ruling. And I, I mentioned some of those individuals. Well, the plaintiffs from that NAACP uh, lawsuit, I think it was six plaintiffs, and f of the six, five were members of Mount Zion. And so we were always at the forefront, uh, pushing the envelope 
for civil rights and for standing at the forefront of helping one another. This community was totally different back then. It wasn't a, this is a, this is a, it was a truly a bedroom community with a, a strong economic engine. Today is a transient community and, uh, and the economic engine is not community oriented as much as it is oriented toward the majority making money on the community. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. Again, I digress. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, how did you uh, become involved in the African American Chamber of Commerce of Central Florida and how significant, piggybacking what you just said, is the presence of black owned businesses to the community? Well, I pastored a church in Winter Haven, Florida from 2002 to 2008, where the Lord spoke and told me that uh, I resigned my position and came back to Orlando. But when I came back, I actually was uh, recruited by the chairman of the board of the African American Chamber of Commerce, uh, which was on a rebound. The African American Chamber of Commerce uh, was formed, I believe it was in 1945. It was called the Negro Area Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, and it was strong, but in the 70s and the 80s, it's, it lost some of its position. And one of the reasons was because of uh, integration and many of the stores and things moved away. Uh, you, had, you, had, you had this new concept of shopping malls. It really destroyed uh, local businesses, especially the black community. But uh, getting back, so I was recruited. Uh, the chairman of the board uh, of, of the chamber at the time was one of my former classmates from high school and college. Matter of fact, we were roommates in college. Ronald Rogers, the late Ronald Rogers, who was entrenched in the political and economic endeavors in Central Florida. I was coming back, understanding that prior to being called to the, to the ministry, I, I worked for Bell South Business System and, uh, and, and had achieved the rank of uh, assistant vice president with them. So uh, I, I had a business acumen that a lot of people didn't know about because most of that occurred in cities and states outside of uh, Florida and Orlando. And when I was called to the ministry, most people think when a preacher called, that's all they've ever done. But I, I, I was a grown, grown man when I answered my call, <laughs> and so my first endeavor was to go, go, to, you know, resign from the, from the, my, my job and I went to seminary and, and, uh, and uh, got the money for the net, you know, did, did what I needed to do to do God's work because I, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me and told me that in order. To, to be successful in today's environment, I needed to have some paper behind my name. And that was absolutely the truth. And I always had the concept, I wouldn't go to a dentist that didn't go to dental school, then wouldn't go to a doctor who didn't go to medical school. How is it that I can ever be, can, can be, a, be a pastor of a church and lead hundreds of people and not go to seminary? So that's been my personal take. And so, I just delved into that. So anyway, Ron Rogers recruited me uh, uh, based on my business acumen, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, we took it, looked at it, and the Lord said, okay, this will be a little ministry. And I, I did both, I was by vocation of doing all of those type of things. I, I think it's important for them. Businesses bring growth to a community. Uh, you got to, if you got a, 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 a an economic engine, if you will, that's the, that's the source. You, you, people live in a community where they can work and where they can live and where they can buy things and and where if the money circulates within the community, then that means that there's going to be some inherent growth from that standpoint. And so, uh, I, I think that economic empowerment in the black community is is, is important. As I mentioned, when I grew up from uh, Orange Blossom Trail 
on Church Street to actually, and there was no I-4, so all the way up to Orange Avenue, there was a hub that was the, that was that, that was like that was like a Times Square for for Orlando because businesses were all the way up. I I don't recall. I mean, any, anything you needed, you know, you needed to get groceries, you needed to buy clothes, you needed to buy appliances, you know, and then if you went north and south on Paramore, uh, get on Paramore from uh, Church Street to Go Avenue, a lot of that was, that's, that was a lot of commercial. Uh, Paramore uh, going north to uh, to really Amelia, because once we got to Amelia, it's, that was residential, as I recall. But a lot of that was commercial as well. And there were black businesses, you know, that, 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 that little store over there, Spotlight, I can't think of the name of the store. Stop Quick? Hmm? Stop Quick? Not Stop Quick. It's a store on the corner of uh, Robinson and, uh, and Palmore. I can't think of the name of the store, but it's still there. Uh, but but yeah, that was a gross store. You go in and get what you need, you know, just like a small Publix. And then there, and, and so so the, the 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 there was such an influx of businesses. Um, you didn't have to go to J.C. Penney's, and although we we went to J.C. Penney's, you didn't have to go to Sears to buy clothes. Uh, there, there were clothing stores on, on Paramore. I, I, I remember getting my my Chucks, uh, Converse, we call them Chucks, Converse. I, I remember the first pair of Chucks coming out of some store that was owned by a black man and, uh, on Paramore, uh, similar, very close to where City View is. See, all of that, so we used to shop there. There were records sitting there, there were radio stations, radio repair, rec uh, places you could buy records, because back then they had uh, phonographs and all of those type of things. There were restaurants, and nice restaurants. Uh, after, after church on Sunday, if you didn't want to cook, you could go and, and sit in one of these, Mom, I call it mom and pop restaurant to get a nice clean meal and some soul food, all of those type of things. All of that existed. Uh, cleaners, uh, flower shops, just everything that you need to have a community to, so that it could be self-sufficient. No longer do we have that, you know, but that came about as a result of integration and then when they came up with the box store concept. When I was a junior, when I was a senior, no, a senior in high school, no, it wasn't. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I remember working at Sears just for a moment. No, that was my freshman year at FAMU. I came home and worked there for Christmas, you know. And and that really was the first time I had started really going into Sears because I could get everything I could get from. from from the stores on uh, in, in, in Paramore. And if the stores were not owned and operated by African Americans, they were then owned and operated by Jewish people, to be honest. And they were, I remember we used to have a store, we used to call it the Jew store, <laughs> because it was a Jewish guy who owned it. It was the greatest guy, I can't remember his name, I can see his picture, his face in front of me. But he, you go in and buy suits and, you know, and everything, and back then, you did there's a term that comes to mind, layaway. They don't have that today. You go in there and get to, you can just pay a little piece and on layaway until you to you to you pay it off whatever you wanted to buy. So it wasn't like well you buy it on credit and you can't pay for it. You pay for it in advance, then you get it. And so, uh, but uh, very robust economic engine in our community back then uh, does not exist today. You know, we, we got businesses in here, but Advent Health, Orlando Magic, City, what they call that? The, the soccer team, Orlando City, is that what they call it? Uh, and some others. Uh, bring in, they, 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 they bring uh, opportunities, but the, the money leaves the community.
Um, <clears throat> what are some of your favorite memories of Paramore? Let's see. There, there's so many, so many, so many memories. Uh, when in my younger days, uh, the Christmas parade was a, would come down wherever it would start, but I know it would come down Church Street on its way to Orange Avenue. And we'd be lined up on Church Street and watching the Christmas parade. I could smell the, the exhaust from the police motorcycles. Jones High Band would be in it and all of these other bands. It just so happened that my family owned some property uh, on, uh, that was on the corner of Lime, and uh, Church Street. And so we would all be sitting out there uh, watching the parade and all of this type of stuff. I, I remember that. I remember uh, the um, the, 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 the churches would have vacation Bible school during the, during the summer. And this was before Boys and Girls Club. Well, the Boys and Girls Club existed back then, but we didn't participate in it. But we didn't need it because we had Vacation Bible School. And I don't know if it's this planned, but it was two weeks. And, and it would be in the morning. And it was, it was a church. Mount Olive was located down where uh, Family Lock Law School is now located. That's where Mount, Mount Olive was. Uh, AME Church. So Mount Olive would have his two weeks of vacation Bible school from nine to one. And then Mount Zion would have his two weeks of vacation Bible school. And then Shiloh would have his two weeks of vacation Bible school. Uh, and then uh, Mount Pleasant, which is now located on Bruton Boulevard, but at the time it was located on the corner of Paramore and South Street. It would have, so, so that's eight weeks of summer you know, so we had our vacation Bible school and we had our, you know, our, that's where we would go. So the kids, you see the same group of kids going from about, and parents would sit them there in the, in the morning and that type of thing. Uh, I remember uh, you know, Carter Street had a, Carter Street Center. I don't know if they still, I don't know if they have a pool, P -O -O, a pool there, but the pool, the Carter Street pool, I know they had to have a Carter, they had to have a pool for us because they wouldn't allow us to go to the pools that they had in other places. And so, but I remember the lifeguards and being, that's where I learned to swim, Carter Street Pool, uh, as a, as a, as a preteen. And, uh, and so you do vacation Bible school and then you, in the afternoon, you go to the Carter Street Pool, the playground and supervise. So, so, so you, so the community, you, you kind of knew everybody because it was a close knit little community. And even though I lived in Washington Shores, I still was spent a lot of time in, in Paramore because of uh, the church and because of the uh, the family that I still had living in this area that we come visit from that standpoint. So, so times that it, 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 it was different. It was different. It was it's, change is in, inevitable. Nothing remains the same, but in some cases, everything does. <laughs> I know the racism. I'll tell you what I remember. I remember some, I, I, my, my parents, we, they would, when I was growing up in Orlando, they, you know, the, I remember the uh, Lynx was not called, I, I don't know, the Orlando Transit Authority, I think that's what it was called, the bus system. And the bus system, they would do some great things. They, on Sunday, they would have a free bus that would ride all through Orlando and pick up all the black people and bring them to whatever church they wanted to go to. Okay, that was good. But off when any other time you got on the bus, you had to sit in the back of the bus. I remember the fare was 10 cents and then I remember when it went to 15 cents and I remember when it went to a quarter. I didn't ride the bus too much because my parents wouldn't allow it because she didn't, my mother and my father, like you can't get on the front of the bus, you don't get on the bus. We can't take you there, <laughs> you know. You can't walk. <laughs> you know, we need to go. <laughs> so my brother and I and my my sister, we we we, we understood. We knew how to we knew how to ride the bus, but we, we were not allowed to do that because of the fact that it made us uh, 
second class citizen, so to speak. My mother, um, who is now in heaven along with my father, my mother was a beautician, hairdresser. She had a little shop in the back of the house and uh, the chemicals from that they used back then for African Americans was so damaging that it affected her hands and she got allergic to all of that. So she had to quit being a beautician. I remember she went to beauty school in New York, to some beauty school in New York. And back that was a, it was a big industry uh, back in those times. Matter of fact, there are several of the members of my church who, who my mother was their hairdresser and they remember me <laughs> as a kid running around getting in the way when uh, they're older now, and, they, and I can't hardly remember them, but but nevertheless, and so, but uh, and so, and when she did, she she couldn't do any more hair. She she became a domestic, and uh, then after uh, I graduated high school, my mother went back, and she became a dietitian, and retired from Orange County School System as a dietitian. But during a period of as a domestic, she worked for us, right right people cleaning our house and all of those type of things. And one of the people that she worked for was a lady by the name of Miss Ruby. It's, it's history. <laughs> and Miss Ruby was a nice lady. But she was working on her her master's degree at Rollins. I saw I suspect her husband was a lawyer, I don't know. I was maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. And uh, she needed to interview. She 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 had to have some people to, so she could do IQs, IQ tests, whatever. So whatever she was getting a master's in. So uh, somehow or another, my mother arranged for <laughs> for uh, for my brother and I to uh, go to her house and uh, we rode with my mom. And uh, Miss Ruby took us when she finished testing us. She took us to the bus station and. and uh, there's one time my mother let us get on the bus to go home, but she was very, very pointed. Don't talk to anybody, don't say anything. If they say anything to you, make sure you, res you, you be respectful because I didn't have a temper, but I, I I didn't like to take a whole lot of mess from when I came to that, and I got some stuff about that as well. But nevertheless, we did this 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 uh, IQ test for Miss Ruby. She made me take it twice because she, she couldn't be, because of my, <laughs> because of the score, and I was a reader. I was an athlete and all those type of things. My mother used to tell me all that that we didn't, we couldn't come to the Orlando Library when I was growing up. They had something called a bookmobile, and the bookmobile would ride to the neighborhood and park, and you go in and you get your books. And, you know, it was like a portable, uh, 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 not a portable boy, you want to call it, a remote. Movable libraries, just some of the books, but they would come in, in our neighborhood and uh, once a week. And my mother would say, "I just she, she she before she passed, she would always talk about how I just would go to the library, the bookmobile, get all of these books, and in three days they would all be read." <laughs> you know, but I still was raising H.E. double hockey sticks with everybody else playing and doing all that type of stuff. But uh, so anyway, so Miss Ruby. I, <laughs> She, she made me take the test twice because she couldn't believe the score. And I was like, but my mother said, it's because you read a, a lot. And so you were exposed to things from that standpoint. But when she took us to the book, when she took us to the bus station, I'll never forget. I was so, I told my mom, I would never do that again. Uh, anything to help somebody like that. Because we got in her car and uh, I'm being naive. I just, I, I rode in the front seat. I got in the front seat of her car, and why did I do that? I didn't know. She said, you can't sit here. So she went in the house <laughs> and got some books so she could put the books on the front seat. They had me and my brother sit in the back seat, because I guess it wasn't kosher for blacks to sit in the front seat. See, that's the kind of stuff we had to go through. And so, uh, and I told my mama about it, and, and, and certainly she, was living, but she explained to me uh, why. I, I got that understanding. Uh, I remember, you may not remember, McCory's and Crest. These were small department stores that, uh, small town department stores. They're, they're nothing like, like 
they Macy's and all of this, but you can go in there and get some stuff. But I remember going in and, and, and we still lived, uh, so I had to be about five years old, five or six. But one, we, we, my mother was, we were in there and my mother was doing something and I saw a water fountain and I went to get drink the water and I went to the wrong water fountain. And I remember my mother, she spotted me out of the corner of her eye and she called my name and she was running to get to me so that I could not drink out of that water fountain. And then she explained and I was like, why? I was thirsty, mom. Said, I know, but she explained that to me. So, so those are the type of things that we had to deal with and, uh, and uh, accept from that standpoint. When Dr. Martin Luther King passed away, he was murdered, assassinated, uh, 1968. He was a junior. Uh, and uh, going into the year, it was just kept completing my junior year, but I was also the president of the youth division for the NAACP. So they had a big memorial service called, because Martin Luther King had come to Orlando and I believe it was 1961, 63 or something like that. But uh, but he had come, been, to, been to Orlando. And did I say Washington, D.C.? No, but he came to Orlando. And uh, so uh, so we had, we had this big memorial. And as president of the youth division, I had to speak at this thing. And I remember Jim Perry and some other individuals who are no longer with us helping prepare me for this speech, which was in the news, people were there. It was at Mount Pleasant, old church over here on South Street, and I, I wrote a speech out, and they kind of rewrote it to make it sound so less militant, <laughs> and uh, which was fine with me because it made sense. Uh, uh, and. Uh, I, I tell that story because the week prior to that, I had an incident in my in my uh, in my home with an insurance man. Back in those days, they had debit insurance people. Well, they would come every week and and collect your premium, thirty five cents, a dollar, whatever, they, door to door, and they would come and do that. And we had Life of Georgia with the insurance company and Life of Washington and all those type of things. But there was this year. So I, 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 this is spring, this is, King was killed in April. So this is during the spring practice for football. We got out of practice early, I went home, and I was in, uh, in, in resting, and the insurance man knocked on the door and walked into the house. And I was like, told him, if you don't get out of here, who, who are you? You know, he just, and he called my mother's name and he, and he just walked in. I said, no, you, you know. And I just, I got, I, and my mother was like, I just went off. I said, get, get, don't, did anybody tell you to come in, et cetera, et cetera, and those type of things. And, and he looked at me like, how dare me? How dare you speak to me in such a tone? And I'm like, but I was a little strapping muscular, you know, but anyway. And so we, uh, and so he stepped out and I said, when, when, when my mother comes to the door and she'll talk to you, but you, you, as long as you come here again, don't you ever knock on this door. I'll tell my dad, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they ended that. So the next week we did the Martin Luther King thing. And then the next week, he, he uh, the same guy, he comes to the door, knocks on the door. And I just happened to be home and answer the door. He said, I saw you on uh, the news. Now I understand why you stood up to me <laughs> like you did. <laughs> he said, because I was, he said, because the NAACP president of the youth division, he said, now I understand why you did that. I I can appreciate that, you know. And may, may never change his mind about what he thought about black people, but at least he changed his mind about what he thought about me. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a little side, side thing. But I, I don't know if this is going where you wanted to go. Yeah, absolutely. This is perfect. Um, you were talking about some of the changes you've seen in the community over the years. Um, can you tell us about some of the, the work and activism that you've done uh, to benefit Paramore? Huh. Well, right now, I mean, in, in, as president of the Chamber of Commerce, you know, we were, we were always <clears throat> champion, trying to be ch champions for black businesses uh, and youth. And so, uh, uh, 
currently I, I, I serve as the, the, the uh, chairman of the Paramore Community Engagement Council. Now what is the Paramore Community Engagement Council? When the University of Central Florida and when Valencia College decided to do a downtown campus in Paramore, those two schools got together. The former president of the West Campus, Dr. Williams, who now is president of the college in Virginia, and I can't remember her name uh, for the bless for the for the for, uh, but, but Dr. but but a, a an employee a professor from the University of Florida, University of Central Florida. Uh, they got together and they said, okay, we need to get the community involved in this. And out of that came the Community Engagement Council. And our job basically is to make sure that the community utilizes the resources that are made available to the community through these two great institutions of higher learning. And so we have seminars, we, we make sure that, 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 that uh, opportunities are available for employment, uh, that, that slots are made available, not necessarily affirmative action based slots, but slots are available where kids can get an opportunity to at least apply uh, uh, and, and take advantage of some of the scholarship opportunities at both of these institutions and things of that sort. Uh, voter registration has probably been one of the greatest pleasures of my life to get people done. I, I have not missed an election since uh, the, the law was changed from 21 to 18. Uh, when I was growing up, you had to be 21 years old to vote. And I believe it was 1972 was the year that the law was changed so that 18 year olds could vote. I believe it was 72, or was it 71? Well, right around that time. But I have not missed a, uh, an, an election, whether it's state, local, of federal since then. <clears throat> and so voter registration has always been something that I've I, I championed and, and, and worked with uh, in, in trying to get help individuals to register and vote because that's how you, that's how you change stuff. And my daughters, uh, we lived in North Carolina uh, and then they, they were elementary school, junior high, and we'd go vote and we lived in the communities where we were, there were not a lot of African Americans and, Back then, uh, you stand in a long line to vote, and, and my kids would be with us the whole time, going through whether it was a primary or whether it was a general election, and and uh, so that spirit has been driven into them, and now they, they they the same thing. They you know it, it's easier though; they can do it electronically and vote by mail and all that stuff. But they they understand the the, the, the role. So that's that's been one of the things we do. We've also, uh, housing has been, one of the reasons communities die is because of adequate housing, uh, inadequate housing. And so we've always been uh, involved in uh, also uh, making sure that in Paramore, it, at one time this community had 15,000 people. Now it's somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000. It's unbelie unbelievable, but you end up, you got to have places for folk to live so you can get those numbers back up. And the numbers may be rising a little bit because we've been working on getting some, a lot of these, we work with the city and getting, and getting a lot of these multifamily units been installed and, and, and uh, Mount Zion was involved in getting some single family units uh, uh, over on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the southern portion of Paramore. Uh, we basically uh, teamed up with uh, several builders, and uh, so that uh, some of the city city uh, owned land could be used for uh, affordable housing. And uh, Daisy Lynham, who was the uh, I don't know if you related to. That's my grandmother. That's your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Oh, bless your heart. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, Daisy Daisy uh, the, the, uh, Commissioner Lynham and I. Uh, you know, I, prior to her, when she, her, in the last couple of years, we, we talked about affordable housing. That was one of the things she moved at. And then Commissioner Hill came in and just picked up the gauntlet and still continued the same thing. I, I remember meeting with Commissioner Hill, and I've been here 12 years. I remember meeting with Commissioner Hill in her first year, 
and doing a slide PowerPoint, a PowerPoint presentation on uh, um, housing and some ideas. And she nodded her head and didn't make a whole lot of comments. But if we looked at what she was doing today, she was listening. <laughs> because uh, I, I think that uh, she followed what had been put in place by Commissioner Lynham. And uh, it's been improvement. Has it been enough? I don't think so. What is affordable housing? You know, are the demographics of Paramore changing? Yes. You know. And so, do we have to adapt to the change? Yes, somehow or another. Yes, we do. But uh, uh, my thing has been uh, to try to bring first time African American home buyers back into Paramore and kind of rebuild the community. To, to the point of room like it was when, when I was growing up. Will that ever happen? I don't know. But we could just do our little part. Um, they said, said one last question, just if you were describing Paramore to someone who had never been here, uh, what would you list as some of the community's assets? <clears throat> well, if I, from, from an, an asset, I think one of the great things about Paramore for the, not the transient residents, but for the lifelong residents is their spirit of unity. Their commitment to keeping the community a thriving community. And so, I think that we have uh, uh, a community, this is a community where the individuals have a desire to want to continue to be a integral part of the Orlando total community. But one of the great assets is its history. You can't, you, you don't know where you, it's hard to determine where I'm going and how I need to get there if I don't look back to what I had to experience, if that makes sense. And so I think the city, I mean this, this community, its greatest asset is probably its, its history and the longevity, uh, its adaptability, and the, the people, the people, the residents who have a desire to flex to be whatever needs to be done, to do and be whatever they need to be to continue on for the next generation. Right now we're, you know, crime in Paramore is not nearly as bad as crime on the east side of Orlando, but you'll never know that. <laughs> Unless you picked up the documents and looked at the reports, which I do, you know. And we, 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 so, we, so this, we just got a black eye just based on perception. Perception is reality. My reality of Paramore is that uh, there's, there's change coming. Uh, and uh, there's a, ch that, that we, 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 as we begin to continue to flex eventually, this will go from being a, the mecca for the homeless, so to speak, to a mecca for individuals who have a desire to, to uh, participate in, 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 in the wholeness of the Orlando community. And one of the reasons that's going to happen is that uh, I think uh, uh, if we, if we continue to address this homeless situation, housing is going to be the key. And, uh, and I know that we are, the government and the community is addressing that even as we speak. All right, well, do you have any, uh, anything else you'd like to add or expand on? Do you have any final thoughts for us? No, I just want to, I, 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 thank you for just allowing me to, <clears throat> to go down memory lane, <laughs> if you will, and with the Paramore, I can, I, uh, during my lifetime has come a long way, which means that We've come a long way from 1880, okay, uh, from uh, Reconstruction. I can only imagine how tough it had to be to deal with what they had to deal with as they went through uh, Jim Crow era. Uh, but I also know that everything is cyclical in life. And so just
just like there was a thriving community of black businesses in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, I suspect that the same is going to occur in the very near future because there are, there, there are just many entities that are doing things to, to, to rejuvenate interest in black business in Paramore. Reverend Spoonie, thank you so much again for sharing your time and speaking with us. This has been Jeffrey Cavero with Dr. Connie Lester and Daniela Lynham on July 17, 2023.